Welcome everyone. My name is Wendy and I work in advancement uh, services and I am going to introduce our panelists and please bear with me if I stumble over some words because this is not necessarily my forte, but here we go. <laughs> so Christy Kenyon's field of expertise is developmental genetics and her research focuses on sensory organ formation in animal systems. In addition, she has been funded by the National Science Foundation and published articles on ways to improve undergraduate STEM education. She teaches courses in genetics, STEM cell biology, developmental biology, and reproductive politics. Renee Monson's areas of research include US welfare reform, child support enforcement policy, presidential election outcomes, collaborative pedagogy, and curricular interdisciplinarity, sorry. <laughs> she yes. served on the American Sociology Association's Task Force on the 21st Century, Liberal Education and the Sociology Major. She teaches courses on gender, family, social policy, research methods, and reproductive politics. And with that, I give you Christy and Renee. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Hobart and William Smith Colleges, folks. Um, we're excited to be here with you today. We want to have a really interesting chat about our biodisciplinary course, The Politics of Reproduction. And we want to highlight some of what we and our students have learned while grappling with the intersections between our two fields of study, biology and sociology. And we want to talk a little bit about how this learning that all of us have been engaged in in this course intersect with the mission and the goals of a liberal arts education for the 21st century. Hmm. All right, so um, we're going to be doing a little bit of back and forth screen sharing um, so that we can show you some things along the way. Some of you may have graduated from HWS uh, 50 or more years ago, while some of the others you have graduated five to 10 years ago. And so um, some of you may have taken um, one or more by disciplinary courses and some may not have any familiarity with it. So what we're going to do is we're just going to, I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to take you to a short slide that I want to show you here. and so that we can just have a little chat about what exactly is a bidisciplinary course. So this is a course that provides students with an opportunity to directly tackle significant academic um, questions and issues from the perspective of two um, different disciplines, biology, sociology, right? And it allows students to see course topics from multiple perspectives to engage in interdisciplinary conversations about the topic and to really understand different pedagogical approaches to a common subject. Every semester, there's usually a few um, bidisciplinary courses that are offered, and each one is usually cross-listed with several relevant majors and minors. The bidisciplinary course that we co-teach, the politics of reproduction, so we'll take a look at it so you can give it a little bit of information about it, um, is cross-listed with public policy studies and also with health professions and um, women's studies and sociology. So we've taught this course four times in the last seven years. And it's designed around several current policy debates having to do with reproduction and reproductive technology in particular. For example, debates about individual access to and state regulation of contraception and abortion, infertility treatments, and genetic testing. What we want students to see, from my perspective, is how these debates are actually informed by some intersecting components of the social world. So let me sketch for you a little I'm, bit. We're going to stop our share for a second. We're going to switch now. Yep. So in my disciplines, we often think about the connections between, on the one hand, social institutions, social structures, and culture. And we think about these as interconnected components of the world that we inhabit. And so in this course, we want students to think about how social institutions like the state intersect with and prop up cultural norms, which are both connected with social structures, for example, inequalities of class, race, and gender. But Renee, we got a problem here. What's the problem? You left out biology. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, you always no, 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 biology no. is definitely not there. It's right here. No, it's in social no. institutions. Modern medicine no, no. is a social institution in the classic sense. Oh, no, no, no. You've got to look at it a different way. You've got to look at it a different way. Go ahead. To, to biology, right? This is not the way that we would draw this. We would look at it something like this where here's our physical world, and 
here's where we would place humans is within this context and here is where the social is and the way that you've done it we don't have anything about the physical world anywhere represented about there yeah no but you have this backwards christy because this diagram is suggesting that humans are contained within and are framed by the physical world when in fact humans our experience of the physical world is always informing the way we understand and even know what this thing is and so the two circles should actually be reversed but you think it implies it's a subset or subtopic right well and of course this is, this is a frame this is a sociological frame so. <laughs> all right so we argue a lot as you can see this is the kind of thing that we argue about yeah mm -hmm. so now here's the thing christy wants to talk to you a little bit about how this connects up with our learning Right, so Christy, yes. So, uh, so what we, what you have heard, is really about a bidisciplinary course that creates an opportunity for us to tackle difficult uh, um, academic questions and issues from this perspective of two disciplines. And uh, what I've learned from co-teaching the course with Renee is that for sociologists, the world is social because humans are fundamentally social beings, um, and we think of an onion where the layers are the social layers. But if you peel all the layers away, the onion in, in, is in an effort to discover the essence of humans, there's nothing left. There's no essential part of humans that exists underneath the layers of the social world. So too with human efforts to um, <clears throat> understand the world around them. Sociologists would say that what we think we know about the world cannot be separated from the social nature of the knower. Right. Now, but what I've learned from co-teaching this course with Christy is that for biologists, the world actually is a physical world, right? In a fundamental, essential way. It's more like an apple than it is an onion, with the very true, essential, real core to it. Biologists would argue that our efforts to understand human experience can't be separated from our efforts to understand all other living organisms on the planet, which of course is the key insight of the theory of evolution. And although human efforts to know the physical world are affected by the social locations that we all inhabit, there's still a real world that can be known that exists independently of human efforts to understand it and describe it. So what we'd like to do now is we want to be able to tell you a little bit about our course. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna screen share again. So what we'd like to do now is take you back just a moment. Um, so I got to just give me a little technical minute here. We're also learning how to use Zoom on a regular basis now for teaching. Um, thanks to COVID-19. So um, there we go. all right. So so what you see in front of you now is a slide that shows you some of the text that we use um, <clears throat> to help really put students into these different kinds of conversations. So you'll see that we use a text about human reproductive biology is shown down here um, and to make sure that all students have the same foundational knowledge about human anatomy and, physi um, and physiology. We also have text focused on biomedical ethics and we also have I think it's, uh, students uh, several frameworks for understanding ethical controversies and dilemmas raised by reproductive technologies. And when we tackle topics such as surrogacy or egg and sperm donation, we make sure students understand the biology um, behind those technologies. What we thought would also be fun this morning is to be able to actually give you an even um, more unique perspective. So I'm gonna stop my share again. So we're gonna, we're gonna switch a little bit up here and we're gonna take you, we're actually in Rosenberg Hall right now and we're in Rosenberg 215 where we actually teach um, the lab portion of the course. So during the semester, the students are in lab at least four times throughout the semester. And they're having an opportunity to actually work with one of my favorite species, my favorite species here, which is the Xenophis latus, which is the South African clawed frog. And, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pick up one of these these are HWS homegrown um, from my lab. And I don't know if you can see, so this is the female. Good morning, everybody. And, or afternoon, I should say. And then if you can see, hopefully you can see that at the end of their web feet, you can see really two black dots. Those are the actual claws that they use as a defense mechanism to push them away. 
And the wonderful thing about this particular species of frogs is that if you inject them with human chorionic gonadotropin, they lay eggs 12 to 16 hours later. And my, our students can actually watch their development. And this over here on your screen, if I go back now and I'm gonna take them, I'm gonna go back to the computer. Oops, sorry. There we go. Uh, you're gonna see now their development in this short movie clip. And so what students can watch in the lab, this is the developing Xenophis um, embryo. And it goes from a one cell stage all the way to tadpole within um, almost a day and a day and a half. And so students get to do manipulations and, and experiments with these um, embryos and to be able to do some ideas testing from that. So the laboratory exercises in the course are integrated with and they are deliberately juxtaposed with the policy implications of reproductive technologies, as well as with sociological insights about human reproduction more broadly. The payoff for students are those moments when they directly wrestle with these different ways of understanding what it means to be human and when they get pulled outside of their comfort zone. And this is what sparks what we would think of as deep learning and aha moments for our students. And we've witnessed several examples of this in our course. For example, one time in the lab, uh, we have students do in vitro fertilization of frog eggs. Students then use a microscope to compare and contrast the physical properties of three different kinds of frog eggs. The in vitro fertilized eggs, right? They are actually doing the in vitro fertilization themselves using the eggs from the one of the frogs that Christy just held up for you to see. So they compare the properties of those in vitro fertilized frog eggs with unfertilized eggs and with fertilized eggs that were produced through the frog's sort of what you would call natural mating, yeah? Students do that compare and contrast of those three different kinds of fertilized eggs at three different stages of development, and then they're, they're required to write up their observations as concretely as they possibly can, with very specific detail, describing what they actually saw under the microscope, and then they have to propose an experiment for future study. Now, the, the twist is that we have them do all this in conjunction with reading a classic article from 1991 by the medical anthropologist Emily Martin. It's called The Egg and the Sperm is the name of the article. And the point of the article was to analyze the gendered language that is typically found in medical school textbooks about what fertilization and development look like, right? And so here's an excerpt from Emily Martin's article. She says, it's remarkable how femininely the egg behaves and how masculinely the sperm. The egg is seen as large and passive. It does not move or journey, but passively is transported, is swept, or even drifts along the fallopian tube. In utter contrast, sperm are presented as small, streamlined, and invariably active. They deliver their genes to the egg, they activate the developmental program of the egg, and they have a velocity that is often remarked upon. Uh, William Smith students, Back. There we go. Um, a William Smith student who was a pre-med biology major emailed us the night before her lab report was due and um, shared this insight with us. Frustrated that I am writing my experimental my experiment proposal, I'm using language that reinstates the active role of the sperm and passive role of the egg. Sperm must navigate through the layers of the egg to initiate fertilization. Awesome that I now recognize that language <clears throat> perpetuates. Not so awesome that I will be spending twice the time trying to figure out ways to manipulate that language in a gender neutral way. For this pre-med student, the frustrating experience of trying to express her scientific observations and questions in a gender neutral way sharpened her sociological understanding of how language constrains as well as expresses knowledge and thus creates as well as reveals gendered worldviews. Now, another central goal of our course is to show students how what we're learning in the lab and in the classroom is relevant to the politics and policy debates of the moment. And so for that reason, we were especially jazzed to be teaching this course in fall 2020 during the most recent presidential election cycle, right? And so we thought, great, this is a wonderful opportunity to show them how some of these debates about reproductive technologies are actually gonna be relevant to some of these presidential debates that they're gonna be watching and then having to cast their ballot about, right? So literally on Thursday, September 17th, 2020, I gave a lecture in class about the current composition of the US Supreme Court and I pointed out the relative age and some background information about the relative health of some of the members of the US Supreme Court. 
right? And I said, okay, we need to be paying attention to this because whoever is the next president is likely going to be having some major influence on changes in the composition of the court, yeah? So the next day, <laughs> literally the next day, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And prior to his leaving office, President Trump's nominee to replace her, Amy Coney Barrett, was confirmed, which gave the court a six to three conservative majority for the first time in a very long time. And just three weeks ago, the court announced that it would hear arguments regarding a Mississippi law that would ban abortions after 15 weeks gestation in order to, quote, protect fetal life, unquote. So the question of when life begins um, in, re in the reproductive process is something that we tackle directly in the course. Obviously from the beginning of the lab and really being able to introduce them to it from the standpoint of frogs, but then moving to talking about humans and about the fact that uh, scientists and biologists don't always agree about when you define and what parameters do they use to define the beginning of life. So for example, point of fertilization may be one place that biologists and scientists may um, point to, but it also may be gastrulation, or it could be when viability, based on the biological parameters being used to define what we mean by biological life. And as, oh, go ahead. Yeah, and as Renee explains, the laws and the policy impose bright line distinction on what is essentially is a fluid process of human development. This is life, this is not life, in order to permit and constrain human choices about reproduction. The lab experiences and our conversations about the biology with frog embryos frequently lead students to the aha moments on this, um, the complexity of this issue as well. So this slide shows you a quote from another student who came to class after one of these experiments with the frog embryos and watching the course of development of the embryos. And he said to us the following, you know, I accidentally punctured a fertilized frog egg when I was trying to turn it over with a pipette and that was in the previous class, which was a lab. And I immediately thought, yikes, what did I just do? I killed it. But then I realized that my reaction suggested that fertilization is the beginning of life. And yet I don't believe that about humans. So this sociology student, right? This was a student who was majoring in well, sociology, but also public policy studies, double major. He was surprised that his lab experience with those frog embryos challenged him to rethink his views about the meaning and significance of particular moments in the process of human reproduction. For us, what is the heart of a liberal arts curriculum are all the ways that different disciplines can be juxtaposed and explored. Here's an example of the kind of thinking on the board our students learn to do in our course. In this ex exercise, you can see how one group of students diagram their ideas about the factors shaping the choices, costs, and benefits involved in whether and when to use genetic testing of embryos and fetuses. Among other things, their diagram indicates that two key drivers of choice, costs, and benefits are, one, how power shapes cultural norms, rights, and obligations of parenthood. And then two, how science and testing technology define and formulate relevant evidence of normality and the abnormality of embryos and fetuses. We think this is exactly what a 21st century liberal arts um, education should do. Equip students with the ability to use multi, multiple disciplinary frameworks to engage the policy debates of the day. And in addition, because of the structure of a bi-disciplinary course, we each get to be the instructor sometimes and a student at other times. The two of us ask each other questions in class all the time. We disagree with each other and we argue with the underlying assumptions of each other's disciplines. And we show our students that learning is messy, it's exciting, it's risky, and it's actually a lifelong endeavor. It doesn't stop when they graduate from college. So what we're doing, or we're trying to do anyway, is modeling for our students how to learn from and engage with people with whom you fundamentally disagree. For us, this is another of the goals of a 21st century liberal arts education. We want to encourage our students to engage in the work of citizenship, which means working together across lines of difference and disagreement, and in so doing, helping to bring about a more just and joyful world. Interdisciplinary teaching is one of the ways that each of us try to achieve these aims of a liberal arts education. So that's the end of our formal presentation, but we are eager to hear your thoughts and your comments and your questions. So please jump in. You need to unmute yourselves if you can. Or so, when the Christine, yeah. and Renee, I'll, I'll come in if it's okay to, to yeah, start absolutely. a little bit. Is that okay? Yeah, I'm Rick Solomon, class of 75. Um, 
and great to see both of you. And one, thank you. That was just a, a great uh, overview of your course and your model. And I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist, but I have a fair amount of training in clinical psych, and I'd be glad to mediate your argument. But that could be <laughs> <laughs> The next time we teach the course, we'll we'll, we'll call you in. I'll be there. I'll be I'll be ready. I'll be ready. <laughs> um, but what I what I did want to point out. Um, for those on the screen that, that, that remember the, the 70s at the, at the colleges is that we were very bidisciplinary back then in much of the curricular emphasis, which you probably know. And I keenly remember uh, in 71, my freshman year coming to Hobart from Quebec. Um, and we only finished grade 11 in Quebec. So I came to the colleges uh, at 16. And I, and I can remember um, Frank Laughlin and John Thiesmeyer teaching a collaborative course that had your kind of energy and zest as they brought the, uh, the, the technology of thinking in a multidisciplinary way to, uh, to our approach to courses. Um, this is quite different than, of course, how we're taught in high schools and particularly how we were taught in more conservative high schools in Quebec. Um, it, it, it really did, I think, in many ways be uh, neurocognitively changing for many of us to learn the underpinnings of understanding a phenomena uh, utilizing two languages. I think it reminds me a little bit of, of bilingualism mm -hmm. and understanding concepts through two languages sometimes gives you various ways to think about that concept that one language will encourage and the other necessarily won't. Um, English and French kind of offering that distinction too. Um, so I, I, I love that mini presentation. I feel like I learned some interesting ways of thinking about a, a phenomena that uh, probably could could learn much more about, but also really feel that the importance of your multidisciplinary model is critical to the maturation of thinking mm -hmm. um, in, in our students. And I, I'm glad to see it come back and orbit back all these years later in a very substantial and so engaging way. So, mm -hmm. okay, I'll be quiet, but thank you. Yep. Okay. I, I came up to William Smith in 1966 and graduated in 70. And so my education was pretty much focused on the major, not a whole lot of, there were some cognitives that you, you could pick that you usually pick the ones that you wanted, um, but there was no emphasis on interdisciplinary um, education. So I applaud this, I, mean, I think it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yes, we quite agree. And I, I, in particular, with the students that come in who are, I'm a bio major and I'm going to be a doctor and I don't need all this liberal arts stuff, right? It's, it's those are the students that truly benefit a great deal from a course like this one because mm -hmm. they, they tend to have assumptions and embedded thinking about the way that they're going to operate or learn in the world. And it's, it's, those that I really push hard and encourage to try to take our course. Very true, because like I was a math major mm -hmm. and I did a lot of music courses because I, if I had a diploma major, it would have been music. Mm -hmm. But um, there was no emphasis in between the two to connect them, although I saw a connection. Um, most people were, if, if you were a science major, you were in the labs all the time with your head down and you never really had the opportunity um, to get another subject that you may not have even thought about to put together and say, you know, how does this relate? Yeah, it's like going up the hill was terrifying. I did it twice. <laughs> And, and the science thing was really, you know, out there because I was always training to be a social activist. So it's like, I can't do either, but you know, I need to, it, it, the, the bi, actually I call it tri-disciplinary. I mean, we were taught the bi-disciplinary and then we were bringing our own thing in and it enabled me through life to make these incredible turns, which I couldn't have done. And even now being retired in this monoculture, New, ha New Yale, what we do and we don't do, People are still on that. I mean, they're, they're like this when they're in their 80s still. So, you know, I'm in a house church with a sociologist, thanks be to God. So there's something <laughs> outside the box, but he didn't teach at Yale. But anyways, the important thing in terms of my research, what I'm understanding the gift of the colleges is in the 19th century, when there was this argument going on between 
do we do places stay a college or they or they store ape the German university model? You know, I was sort of looking at like, well, you know, German universities and kindergartens transport American education, but then the college thing was about building character and creating the nation. So I'm just really happy you guys are doing the work because it really because no one's ha was having that conversation recently about character formation and you know beyond the rigid thing but that thinkers were doing this in the mid 19th century and they were taking the little books from new haven and boston and those little books went to you know the, the finger lakes and the little books went to ohio and an african-american theologian i worked with in the community we were like yeah and the little books went south in terms of those little white ladies who were teaching in schools so you're getting to the essence of something that was very rigid but for me, it was always very much alive. And when you go dive into the sort of that 19th century stuff, if you get through the, the, you know, the racism, the classism and all that other stuff, you see this kernel of what is it to become a democracy? Yeah. You mm -hmm. can't think, we, how do we become a democracy? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I often think that I want to go back and take some of the courses. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, come on, you come. We'll, we'll let you know the next time we teach this. So, um, absolutely. We'll get you I, stashed, I stashed away all these books. So when I, came, well, I was sent to New Haven, I was like, how do I know New Haven? It was like, well, you know, because all those guys were studying in the 60s, they were studying, you know, New Haven. And, and then mother sold their house. I had to throw all these books. I was like, I was even reading Jim Spates' stuff when I wasn't taking his classes. I mean, stuff, you know, I was buying these books even if I weren't taking the classes from these guys in life. So thank you again. You have no idea about what you're doing to change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, we haven't heard from you. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, so uh, class of 2008, also a math major in math and physics, and um, so I teach at uh, Elmira College, a small college down about an hour south of y'all. Um, so yeah, I'm fresh out of teaching our, uh, we have like a May term, a five-week May term. Oh, um, yes. A course on kind of math and politics and um, social justice where we're looking at voting and redistricting, so one of the things I'm kind of grappling with, and so I want to selfishly ask is kind of how to, how to reckon with kind of maybe some of the math or for, for you, maybe some science anxieties that the oh. students might be grappling with, as well as for the science students, as you alluded to, the notion of how written communication matters, right? So there's really those two arms that students are really grappling with both and how they interconnect to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, it, it's an excellent point. Um, this is the way that I also teach intro bio. I'm sort of the throw them into the pool and show them that they're actually swimming as opposed to convincing them to go into the water, right? I mean, I think that's where getting them right into the lab and saying, yes, you're gonna do this, right? So you're gonna, you're gonna take testes and mince up testes and apply it to frog eggs that I'm going to give you a dish of frog eggs. You know, I don't, it's like, we don't even give them necessarily the opportunity to say, I'm not a science person. It's like, nope, yeah. here's the dish, go for it, right? So, and then, and then we work the whole semester to really focus on le letting them know that there's, they've got the, the ability to think scientifically. This is no special, you know, uh, <clears throat> there's no special hack or there's no special tool you need to be able to do this. Um, but it, it is a lot of, I would say, PR effort, right? To really reach them and convince them that that's true. Right, yeah, we don't let them say I'm not a science person. Right, we emphasize if you're a human, you can do science because science is a human endeavor. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to William Smith when we went through a lot of social turmoil. I was there from 66 to 70, so okay. it was just unbelievable. But they never really thought to bring some of those things together so that we could understand them relative to where we were headed. Mm -hmm. Adam, from a, a clinical psych perspective, I just want you to know, Christy and Renee are doing implosion therapy. So what they're doing is they're just <laughs> throwing them into the anxiety precipitant and saying, <laughs> you can do this. And it, it actually clinically is a very, very good model for handling anxieties. You know, you in you go, there's a bit of a life preserver there. They sense the life preserver a little more and, you know, they do just great. So so I, I, I love that answer. I thought that That's was it. just it's perfect. And, and see a little clinical psych creeping into their model. It's wonderful. It's way it's less like, intimidating than trial by fire. <laughs> it sounds way better. 
<laughs> but I will confess that's something that was hard earned, learned right from teaching. I was not, that was not, I was not, when I started the teaching, I did not think to get to that anxiety piece, right? And, and I, back to psychology, I think I made a lot of attribution errors about my students who came in with the hoodies and sat in the back of the class and were like, and, and I took that to mean that they were disengaged and that, you know, and, and I almost was defensive in working with those students rather than looking at it from an anxiety perspective and, and how, how to be able to talk to them differently about what they were really experiencing. Yeah. yeah, it really would have been helpful through the 60s to the 70s for us, because we went through, we came in as prim and proper young ladies, had to wear skirts, yeah. you know, couldn't wear slacks of any sort until maybe Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank God for Saturday. <laughs> yeah, thank God for Saturday. And Dean Heath would watch us coming down from the hill, and if we weren't appropriately dressed, she would rap on the window to send us back up. And uh, that was my freshman year. By my sophomore year and junior and senior year it was you could wear anything anytime or not wear anything as the case may be you know we couldn't have guys at the up in the dorms until like I think it was 4 30 in the afternoon and they had to have two feet on the floor right. um, and then um the two of you right Two of the four feet had to be on. No, all four feet had to be down. <laughs> all four feet had to be down, and the house mothers would come through and check on. You know, still be done. But it's more yeah. down. So it was by that. That was my freshman year. By my junior year, we had parials anytime you could have guy in the, in your room, no matter what. And there was a definition of um, cohabitation. They just couldn't put anything in the bureau drawers. Mm -hmm. and, you know. So it would have been interesting to have a lot of the interdisciplinary um, discussions during those years to try and bring some of that together. We all kind of kind of put our blinders on to just we're here to get a degree in many ways. Do you guys still though break out in terms of your um, um, disciplines when you socialize, or is there are, are enough people living around Geneva to get to know each other in terms of faculty? Did the two of us break out of our disciplines when we yeah, yeah, in, gen in general? Can you make a generalization about the faculty? Oh, yes. Faculty socialize across disciplinary lines all the time. All the time. Cool. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. See, and that okay. didn't happen when I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. yeah no, no, that's, that's quite common. Um, I, you may be familiar with a, a place that was, I, I'm sure, has been there a very long time called the Seneca Yacht Club, which is on the other end of Seneca Lake. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we could run a faculty meeting there. Oh, yeah. Um, because oh. You know, like, just, you know, I think at least, you know, probably, I don't know, probably a quarter of the faculty go there. And so hang out. hang out. And so you could, you know, you can read. Very your cool. Studies, you can, you know, so, I mean, all the disciplines are, you know, religion. Yes. So um, biology, yeah, all, all kinds. And, and we hang out all the time together. <laughs> Yeah, we're best friends. <laughs> okay, so for the two of you, so, uh, so here's here's a question. So I only do sort of like primary research and then I use it. So the interesting thing about Anna Botsford um, uh, Comstock was that she started off as um, a, a Quaker Society of Friends. And she ends up, which the Society of Friends is very comfortable in New York and very comfortable in Pennsylvania. And she ends up, of course, with us in terms of, you know, and being the whole biophilia thing. I mean, that's that's her thing. But she gets radicalized on one level by when there's the um, horrible stuff that's going on in the 1890s in New York. And, you know, Felix Sadler and all these guys are going, what do we do to feed New Yorkers? And they get her involved with in terms of how do we do something in terms of these people aren't staying on the farms and, you know, having food for us. So I would love if you two could look into that three things going on, that you've got a scientist, which Ms. Mrs. Comstock was a scientist, basically. Mm -hmm. so logically, you've got Felix Adler, who you can't really touch because he had left, um, he had started off as German Jewish, but he'd start Ethical Cultural Society. Okay. So it's, that's a problem when you come to religious stuff. Mm -hmm. And she leaves, you know, so she leaves Society of Friends, becomes a Unitarian, which are usually Bostonians. So when little Boston ladies, you know, go out to Ohio to, you know, you've got like, then, you know, then they create little um, Unitarians. So you've got these Boston literary types that show up 
coming across the Western Reserve. And you've got these scientists and you've got these activists. And so I would love for someone from the colleges to figure this out. But to try this, because it's walking in the weeds of every discipline. I mean, I Bostock is a pure biologist. Adler is not a pure because he's ethical culture. You know, it's so you've got this. You know, I was studying why do people come into the Episcopal Church and become activists, and now I've seen all these people exited and what else there, and they did amazing stuff in the academy. So if you could figure that out, I mean, that would be kudos to William Smith. We well, can probably put you in touch with somebody in the religious studies department. No, right? I want you two to talk about it with them. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> because, it's a, because, because they'd be walking into a landmine like I've right. been doing my entire life. Right. Well, so the, the one thing that I will say that you know, <laughs> from an academic standpoint, we don't tackle that religious question from an academic oh. standpoint. However, we pull back the curtain for the students about our okay. own personal lives, right? right? And so, okay. so, and about, you know, how, so, we talk about a little bit about our own, you know, beliefs and or or our potential worldviews come into play, and I think that's where some religious perspectives, you know, come into to that part. So, and I, you know, I share like the ultrasound of my daughter and my son is, you know, and having some of these conversations about genetic testing, for example, and the fact right. that I'm also Catholic, right? So, and Whoa. so and this yeah. is something that I share with the students, right, about what that means. So, okay, good. We're willing to sort of go out on that plank and, and bring it in a little bit and have those conversations good. in front of the students. Right. And we actually, one of the textbooks that we use, yes. I don't know if you want to go back to that slide, Christy, or not, but one of the textbooks that we use is titled The Moral Veto, and it engages directly the question of how religious um, viewpoints have been deployed in strategic right. in mm -hmm. strategically strategic ways right. over the last 200 years around debates not only about abortion, but also contraception. Mm -hmm. And so we right. have to engage with how ideas are used and deployed in a variety of ways, as well as how they are part of our lived experience as individuals. Right. And they, Very have, cool. to write it, they have to write one of the exam questions, right, forces them, right, to have to actually put in conversation Excellent. people from these different perspectives. So and wow. use their those texts to be able to then um, to be able to support their claims. You guys are great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you can't tell, we love our jobs. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> I don't see people smiling that way in New Haven. I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Just want you to know. <laughs> Take it you're in New Haven, Christine. Pardon? Take it you're in New Haven. Yeah, I got sent to a uh, divinity school uh, against my will. I wanted to go to I wanted to go back to the Finger Lakes. I wanted to go to Rochester, but <laughs> I ended up staying because everything I was studying to go back to to New York. Someone looked at me from City Hall and said, "We got the same problems in New Haven." And that's when I realized I had learned all about New Haven from all of these guys that had been doing their doctor work in the '60s. <laughs> I went to the one neighborhood where they never let Yaleys in, so it was sort of the one more place that had to be opened up. But yeah. yeah. I'm in Connecticut too. So. Where are you? Summers, up oh. on the border. Wow, you're really up there. Yep. Well, it's not very, Connecticut's not very big, so it's not that <laughs> far from New Haven. It's, it's like about an hour and 15 minutes and you're in wow. New Haven. So, yeah. So we all get together one day. That would be fun. That would be fun. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll go through the list of people that I sort of, I emailed to and said, where are you? <laughs> 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 Sorry for talking to you so much. I'm just all excited to be. <laughs> We're glad that you are glad. And I think Wendy or some, um, the advancement certainly could let you know, but I believe they actually recorded this. So if you uh -oh. have people that you know missed the opportunity to see it, um, oh, good. to view it, I think they're going to be able to share it access of the recording to be able. Oh, to good. All right. That'll be great. Thank you. I love the Pulteney Street survey, but I'm, you know, being auditory, this is really wonderful. Right, yes, so yes, different. absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and for us too, this is our opportunity to, to do this without masks. So the campus now, because of, you know, their vaccination rate among faculty is like extraordinary, it's like 99% or something. Yay! So we, are, we are, are able to be in the classroom again without masks and in the building right. without masks. So we, we jumped on that chance to do it together. <laughs> So when did you guys, I'm sorry, start at the colleges? When, when, what year, what decade? When... 1998. 98. And I came in 2003. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Christy and Renee, I don't, I don't know how much time we have left, but I did want to pose a, just a quick question. One of the classes I teach at URI, University of Rhode Island, is, is the Child Maltreatment Colloquium, which I've been teaching for quite some time. Um, and when I started the colloquium back in the early 90s, it was with uh, our chair of our sociology department, Richard Gellis, who has uh, went on to UPenn and unfortunately and sadly passed away last year. Richard, just a brilliant researcher in the field of family violence and child maltreatment. And, and I realized co-teaching oh, yeah. a sociologist, I learned so much about sociology. I just started to understand his research methods and his way of thinking a little more. Um, and perhaps, I don't know, but perhaps I was able to help him more on the clinical side. Mm. Um, and as I've carried the course forward, we teach it twice a year, um, I feel I have such a powerful sociological contribution to make to the course, certainly not being a sociologist, but really uh, channeling Richard's contributions in those first 10 years. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what impact you've had on each other, um, which was my long-winded question. Uh, it's such, it's yeah, such a wonderful yeah. thing. <laughs> you write a book, I think, right? Yeah. So yes, um, absolutely. I, I, I don't teach any of my courses the same way I did before we started teaching the course. Um, so, you know, and, and even sperm and egg, when I teach my developmental biology class, um, it gives me such richness to be able to draw upon, to be able to then use this course um, in really unique ways. So, oh. yeah. And I would say that I don't teach my gender course the same way that I did before I started teaching with Christy either. Uh, mm. One of the core debates in gender these days has to do with whether gender identity has anything at all to do with biological sex. Um, and I engage my students in those debates in a very different way than I did before I co-taught with Christy and was forced to grapple with some of the epistemological assumptions of my own discipline as contrasted mm. with hers. And so I think it's enriched both of our teaching and I think our students, whether or not they take this particular course from us, mm -hmm. are still in some ways learning from both of us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, that was great, great to know. Well, I think we are out of time now, unfortunately. Boy, we could keep talking for a long time. This is great. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. It was a perfect bow to tie at the so end. We would love it if you want to reach out with further comments or observations. Please feel free to contact either one of us or both of us. Yes, absolutely. Great. Right. Thank, thank you, you so for much. your work. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, nice everyone. Bye now.